Hello. Hey artists, writers and friends. Welcome to this episode of my Artist to Artist in Conversations. It gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce you to the artist Nicholas Middleton. Nick is currently doing an MPhil at the Royal College of Art and he did his undergraduate at the Winchester School of Art. Nick is very well known for his black and white realist paintings and he is often showing paintings in the John Moores. So now I would like to invite Nick, Nicholas Middleton to come to the table and we can start a conversation. Thank you very much for allowing me into your space uh, and right. to see your... Thank you. Where you were. Okay. Okay. It's lovely. Thank you for the biscuits. That's okay. Although I've got them all here. Nice coffee. Anyway, everything okay? You good? Yeah, yeah. You well? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Well, let's get to some questions on the go and uh, let's get a chance to listen to what um, all about what Nick does as a painter and other things. Anyway, let me actually start off with a very straightforward question. How did you get into making art and why? Um, well, I think one of the the things that I was thinking about when when you, um, you know, were so kind to send me the questions in advance is that almost every child makes art of some kind, drawing, painting. It's more the question is what stops you from continuing, um, and I, I guess the main reason that I continued to, to to make art through you know from growing up. Was it, it was part of my family background, so there was no no point there. You know, it stopped being this kind of childish activity, and then started being a different kind of activity. It was just a continuum. You know, you're, when you're three, four, five, you're always drawing. Mm. You go to school, and you're you're drawing and painting, and mm. then just you know you continue. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so you really did enjoy. The creative side of, of you when you was at, when you was at school as a youngster, and that's something that you saw yes. on yourself. I mean, I, I um, yeah, I think I was always keen to to, to you know be, be drawing, painting mm. um, when I was at school, uh, and so yeah, just continued. Mm. Cool. Okay. Well, okay. Well, taking taking that into consideration, where did you when sorry when did you decide to make art, practice, and occupation? Um, I think that I never really made any decision not to. Mm. So it, it was a case of not consciously trying to do anything else. Um, I mean, m maybe if I'd had a, a, a clearer aptitude at something other than art, I probably would have done that. But it was the root of le least resistance. So, you know, I just, when I, when I finished sort of, uh, compulsory schooling then went on A levels, planning on being art, and then straight from that to a foundation course in art and design, and then and then studying fine art at a degree level. Um, and I, as I say, I, I guess there was no actual conscious decision, you know, to make it as an occupation. It just seemed to be. Um, you know the most straightforward uh, sort of passage, as it were. Uh, so it, uh, yeah, as I say, I just feel like there was never really a, a conscious decision. It's interesting because I remember in the nineties when I was at art school, and you the, you, you look in the prospectus because you're looking to apply, and it says about occupations. What well, it used to in those days, if you go, it was on like on the, the right side of mm -hmm. the bottom, it would say what you can do with your degree, you know, illustration or, or for books or something, you know. Yeah. And uh, for myself, I never really knew where necessarily I was going to go with a degree. What would happen in the future? You just yeah. wanted to be an artist. You looked at great artists, work at the National Gallery, you look in the books, you think, I want to be an artist like them. So the idea of an occupation, like going to catering school, you're going to get a qualification, you'll end up cooking yeah. in a hotel. It's yeah. like a sense of, a purpose for that but with a degree it was like you just wanted to be an artist but the idea of maybe you might be a lecturer or a teacher but generally you wanted to be a, an artist 
do you remember experiences like that? Did you look in a, in a, in a prospectus and say, oh, yeah, that's what I could do with an art degree? Or was it as, say, you just you want to be an artist? And... I mean, I think it was a case of the latter, just you know, wanting to be an artist as mm. much as anything else and probably not having a clear idea of what mm. the future might be. Mm. Um, never having like a, a, a sort of projection into the future of some idea of a career, but just yeah. what the sort of next immediate thing was. Yeah. Um, sort of all through that that process from from school onwards. It's quite it was quite exciting in a way, wasn't it? Because you didn't quite know what to expect. Yeah. Uncertainty in a way was quite pleasurable. Yes, I mean it certainly is. Sort of, you know, at that age. Oh. Just everything's everything's new. The next step is always mm. an exciting one, which has possibilities. Mm. Absolutely. Where well, it seems like today, you know, I listen to my children, and it's like you have to. Everything's all mapped out. Like you've mapped out the next ten years. You're going to do this. You've got to do that. Academically, and where's it going to lead? What kind of job? And it's yeah, it's quite different these days. It as it comes across to me. You're a teacher as well, though, aren't you? So. Yes. Tutor. So do you see changes in, in that way? Um, I think there is more of a, I suppose, a career focused mindset whereby people treat education as a form of an investment now. Mm. And there's definitely a feeling that if you're going to be investing in that education in some way that perhaps some kind of quantifiable outcome mm. career-wise makes sense. Um, you know, I studied my uh, undergraduate degree during the 1990s, mm. so this is you know, before tuition fees, mm. and it was at the point where student loans were coming in for maintenance, but okay. before having to pay tuition fees. So I think there was less of a, an emphasis on, on that, you know, when when you went to university, you know, perhaps my peers knew what they wanted to do, but I certainly it was you go to university to study a, a subject that you love. Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. definitely. So when you were at art school, and in a way, growing as an artist in your younger days, and now. You can still apply this to, to well, yeah, now. Which artists and painters um, do you think is making relevant work today? In fact, what artists, um, what artists were you looking at a lot when you were growing in terms of education? When you were when you were aspiring artists, and who were you looking at? What inspired you? Who inspired you? And and today, actually, as I say in the question, which artist and painter do you think is making relevant work today? So hopefully, you can. Talk about the ones you were looking at. I mean, I, you know, I sort of want to question what what the term relevant is doing. Uh, what, you know, relevant to whom and where and why and, and so on. Uh, but I can probably ask the idea, uh, answer rather the, 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 the question about you know, who I was looking at. And obviously looking at loads of different artists mm. and they're constantly changing. Um, certainly when I was doing my, my degree, um, Towards the end of that period, I was really interested in pop art, so I made lots of work which is, I suppose, inspired by that in, in some form. Um, it might also be worth mentioning that when I was doing my degree, I wasn't studying painting. So okay. that, although I was looking at paintings, but I was sort of looking much broader, um, I was specialising in printmaking, so that sort of perhaps influenced some of the choices of the artists that I might have been looking at at the time. Um, and, you know, sort of leading on from that, when I finished my degree, I then did start, or perhaps go back to painting after, um, you know, you outside of the, the, the institution where you've got the access to all those materials, and painting was something that is quite easy to do. You don't need a workshop, you don't need printing presses. Mm. Um, and so it's, it was like, again, the, the next logical step, um, you, you come out of the degree, you don't really know what's going to happen next. It's really easy to get the materials and 
quite a bit of time and space to, 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 to make funny things. Okay. Um, back to the idea of, of relevance, I mean, it's, I think one of those things that, in some respects, whether you're asking about which artists are relevant to me or, or, or a broader question of relevance, but I think that you can never sort of really know the, the times that you're living in while you're in the middle of them. Mm. Maybe, maybe 20, 30 years' time, we can look back and say, this, you know, this person here, or, you know, these artists, this group were making the stuff which reflected those times, perhaps, or, or you know, held up a mirror to them, or whatever. But, um, yeah, I would find it hard to sort of pinpoint relevance in a, in a sort of more direct way. Okay, so there's that sense of you're questioning what relevance can it mean in terms of the collective or collective identity in terms of the general public but there's well, also think, the other side yeah so what's I think, relevant to you then yeah so i think one of the yeah that my, my initial question sort of back to your question yeah. was it's like how, how are you you know positioning the idea of relevance, relevance. yeah oh well there you go that's interesting um okay well i suppose we could say obviously with an, an interview like this is like we could talk about the relevance that art is playing on your own work, yeah. in your own thinking, the way you, what particular artists are relevant to your development. And obviously there is that sense of collective relevance. Who is relevant for, you know, who's making paintings today in this climate as well with so much that's going on? What could be seen as relevant? Is painting relevant? Is it still relevant? Now, that's like you just highlighted that something, you know, maybe in 10, 20 years down the road, we say that was very relevant for them. Maybe a Toyman's painting or whoever, you know, that was very relevant. They made a paint, the well known painting that Toyman's did of uh, Still Life, huge canvas. And it was at the time of the um, Twin Towers came down in 2001. And I think he made it just over the time or just post that, the event. And people said, why did you respond to the 9-11? He said, well, yeah, I did with this painting of the still life. And I think people were, oh, right, and couldn't quite fathom that one out. Now, that's we can talk about that 15, 20 years down the road and talk about why was it relevant, what was its contribution to the times, politically, historically. So, yes, the, I like the, what you were highlighting. I think that's quite interesting in terms of, in the future we decide what was what is kind of relevant in a way mm. so we could talk about this collective relevance which in a way this question is highlighting which artist painter do you think is making relevant work today yeah what is relevant what does that mean well i suppose that you know are you are you are you sort of being particular about looking at painters or talking about artists more generally so I think I would find it easier to answer the, the latter um, rather than thinking about particularly painting. But you know, maybe that's more to do with the sort of things that I've been looking at recently rather than necessarily is the case. Uh, I mean, I certainly um, have found what forensic architecture have been doing is quite compelling. And I know there's lots of debates around, you know, what it is they're actually doing but you go to an art gallery and you see one of their exhibitions um and I, you know i as i say i find it quite compelling and it does speak to things which are happening in in the world at the moment um and i i don't know whether i can think of a, a, a painter which is doing something similar um but perhaps you know People want different things out of different forms of art. So, like a, a you know, multimedia installation isn't going to give you the same things that a set of paintings will. Yeah, I mean, if you take Frieza art fair, is there something relevant there? You know, is can you say there's anything being made that's relevant in the Frieza art fair today? But maybe that's you know subjective, highly subjective. So, uh, <laughs> um, 
Okay, so obviously there's work that you find relevant to your, for instance, your research, and you're doing a PhD, so obviously yeah. it's work that's relevant to yourself. That you, I mean, that's, good. that's a different kind of relevance. Yes. Is there anything there you can maybe highlight in terms of what's relevant there? Well, I've recently been looking at, I suppose, what you could probably call structural filmmakers from 1960s, 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s perhaps. So people like Hollis Frampton, Michael Snow, I mean, they, they feel like they've become more relevant to, to the work I'm making now. Um, again, obviously, they're, you know, they're not painters. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm looking a lot more broadly about you know, what it is to make images of the world. Uh, and some of those sort of structural aspects I find are, are, are the things which are, are interesting me sort of, you know, right at this moment. Okay. Okay, well that's, that's nice. Um, actually, we're going to, we'll touch on, um, I'm going we'll be asking a question which is related to your PhD a little further on, so we can come back to some of that. Um, but actually, before we get to that, the question I want to ask you is how do you start a work and do you have any rituals or simply a, repet a repetitive routine work going to work? Um, I think there's, you know, certainly I wouldn't say I have any rituals. Uh, you know, how, how, how does one start a work? Uh, if you're talking about all the steps which are preparation for it or, or whether you're talking about, you know, the, the aspects of just going to the studio and starting, it's usually turning the radio on and making a cup of tea. Uh, I think that's as ritualistic as it as it gets. I, mm. I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, it's. I suppose you could describe it as like going to work. Okay. Um, so there's that kind of going into the studio, putting the lights on, making a cup of tea, maybe having, maybe walk around looking at what you're doing, consider what you're doing. And do you um, do you have a no? I, I I mean I would I normally would know what it is. I'm doing before I start so I, I tend I mean I do sometimes work on a number of paintings at the same time but I, I tend to have quite a, a focused approach to the work that I'm actually making so there's there's nothing spontaneous or improvised about so it's quite structured thing. yeah so I, I'll, I'll know it'll be like you know most two or three maybe four paintings that I'm working on at the same time and I'll go to the studio knowing okay I need to do this and this painting and then the next piece has you know this needs to be doing to it um, so at the time in the, the studio is generally very focused it's it's just I suppose you know the process of going through the, the actions of making work and the process of making work yeah. Is there a repetitive approach to the way you make work? So I know you use grids. Yeah. So in order to, you have obviously a, 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 an empty canvas, and then obviously by the end of that empty canvas, you've got a, it's full up with, with signs, painted mm. signs. But how do you go about that? Do you have a process of from getting from A to Z, you know, um, a journey? So would you prime up to, from priming up to conclusion? What yeah. is that? What's what's, the, what's that process for you? It's, I feel it's hard to d describe it. Um, I mean, it's quite simple. Uh, depending on what it is I'm painting, um, because I work from photographic sources, so I, you know I, I know what the painting I'm going to make is going to look like. Mm. Uh, it's usually just a straightforward sense of getting the, you know main tonal areas down from working on a large canvas often uh, which I don't do that much these days it can be as simple as starting at the top left corner working down to the bottom right corner mm. uh, with, with the smaller work on paper that I do or board it tends to be done in two maybe three layers so you start off with the um, sort of a simplified range of tones and block all of those in first and then go on to sort of refine those, add more detail in, and so on. Um, 
And this, uh, this here, something here that you could say? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if there's anything in particular that I could say directly about any one of these paintings. Um, I mean, the, the, the painting here, which is just on paper at the moment, um, which may, may mm. get... I may get mounted at some point. Yeah. Um, I think that took three sessions in the studio, maybe slightly longer. Again, as I say, you know, the first uh, session would be to get all the main tones mm. filled in. The next session to, to kind of like solidify them, refine them, mm. add in details, and then then a sort of like a, a final. Uh, approach where there might be a small amount of glazing or, or mm. whatever just to get you know the balances of the different tones working um, fine-tuning some of the details and so forth uh, so you, you don't varnish at the end like this um, I've tended not to but yeah. most of the work on paper that I've done although not exclusively it gets framed under glass, so I, I tend not to varnish uh, afterwards. Okay. Why the why um why do you put them in a, within a box frame? Because obviously with the glass, it would be quite reflective. Uh, I think it's as much as anything because they're so small. So I mean, this this painting isn't at, you know the smallest. Um, so a work like this, it's not actually cropped out from. Uh, the paper that is painted on but it will be cropped and then placed into a, a larger frame um, I think you know just as it is as the painting it's too okay. I think it's too too small just to hang on a wall on its own really mm. I mean it, it could do but uh, you feel like you need something else yeah to... yeah I think so can I just show the camera that yeah one? that is gorgeous that's a gorgeous painting I don't know if it's too dark. Beautiful painting. I think you have to see that definitely in the flesh. That is a lovely painting. Okay, that's interesting. Well, okay, next question. The majority of your paintings are in black and white as we can see, uh, grayscale. What is the reason for this palette? Why the emptiness of primary colours? When I look at your paintings, I think of old black and white Hollywood movies. Are these black and white movies a reason for your reduction in palette? Or is there another reason? Or other reasons? Well, the, 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 the simplest reason is because I work from my own photographs most of the time, and the photographs that I take, I usually take on film, so the shot on film, and I develop them myself. And a lot of those photographs, I won't be taking them with the intention that they're going to make a painting. So I'm just taking photographs. And then at some point later, I'll look back and there'll be something compositionally, something about the light, um, occasionally something about the subject matter as well, mm. which will make me think that it could make an interesting painting. Uh, and so at that stage, you know, it's a black and white image already. Um, it would feel artificial adding colour to it. Uh, so that is the, the simplest answer. So going into a bit more detail, I do like those restrictions. So I mm. like working black and white because mm. then it takes out the whole question of colour. So you don't have to think about it as, as making work. And then with the small paintings that I've been making, which are the size of postcards, mm. they're all made to the same size. Um, but within that, they have a, an integral painted border. Um, and the border will change depending on the proportions of the image. But it means that I know what the size is, and I know what the colours are I'm going to be working with. Um, so you've already made two really important decisions without actually having to think about them uh, and then you know the rest of the painting follows. I was just thinking about you just mentioned like looking at a postcard and then within this painting you have your, your hand or someone's hand holding brandishing a what looks like a photo a postcard yeah it's interesting you 
the sort of relationships are joining up the dots here. So was there was that in your mind in this one? Did you is it a case of you know you've been working on postcard size that you wanted to have a postcard in one of your compositions? Well, this this particular uh, painting was based on a, a photograph, which actually is an reenactment, a reenactment of a, a shot from a film. Mm. So um, it was reenacting a shot from uh, Vin Vendor's film Alice in the Cities, where two characters have been looking for this particular house, which is in the photograph that the hand is holding. Uh, and at the moment that they find the house, one of the characters has a close-up shot where you see his hand holding the photograph. Right. Um, so I actually traveled to the same location where the house still exists and took a photograph of my hand holding a photograph which is taken from the film itself. Yeah, okay, so this is an image of the film. So this is an image from lifted from the film. So the film, the the image within the image is taken from the film. Okay, and you're simulating that. And I'm 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 yes I'm uh, recreating the composition yeah. from the film. Although I couldn't recreate it exactly because in the film the character holds the photograph with his right hand, and in order to take the photograph, being right-handed, mm. I held the photograph in my left hand. Mm, so okay. it's a, you know, it's it's not a straightforward uh, recreation mm. of that moment from the film. Yeah. But the action itself was the same. So standing in a street by this house, holding the photograph, and then photographing it, um, and then subsequently it became a painting. Okay. But then you had. Wasn't there another reason for this? Wasn't there something almost kind of slightly self-destructive? There was a, a destructive process that was going to be introduced, but that you changed your mind with, with that. Um, well, one of the, the uh, things about this particular painting was I, I made it sometime after I took the photograph, and I felt like the photograph was sufficiently uh, evocative of the moment of its kind of recreation of the, 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 the image from the film um, to stand alone. And in making the painting, there's sort of one step of remove mm. from that moment of recreating the film. And that, that one remove, perhaps I felt that somehow reduced the direct, I don't know, reduced the, the not necessarily the appeal of the image so much, but mm. it re reduced the meaning of the image, or at least the meaning of the image for, for me. So... I did think about taking this this painting and actually documenting it being destroyed as a way of preserving the original photograph's meaning, um, which I haven't done yet. Uh, the viewer was ever to destroy the stone, yeah. pass it to me. <laughs> in fact, funny enough, this um, this work hasn't been in your hands for quite a while. Now you've got it back because it, it's been out. It was in a show, I believe, was it last year? Yeah. and it's um, travelled around a little now you've got it back in your hands mm. back in your studio space in, in the, you know here um, how do you feel and have you created new do you feel like you're seeing it in a different light since you made it um, well I think it, it looks better than I remember it mm. <laughs> uh, and I can also see a few things which I would see little alterations that I want to, would want to make not just really? Yeah, there's just a couple of things. That, you know, I feel like the perspective on the um, cooling tower is just a tiny bit out. Um, there's a couple of bits on the, the painted outline, which probably could do with another coat of white. Probably won't show up on the on the screen, but you can see the uh, remains of the grid from from gridding up the original image. And I like that though that you see. Yeah, is wearing your heart on your sleeve slightly. Well, only only very slightly, <laughs> just a little. Yeah. Okay. Now, it's, uh, personally, I think it's a very beautiful painting for, you know, for what it is. Thank you. But you, as an artist, and I know that myself, you see those things, and it it, it sort of niggles with you. And 
you can, can't put it down until you know you're satisfied. And others always say, oh, yeah, this is amazing. And they like it for their reasons. But mm. Okay, well, that's nice. Uh, it's funny, actually, you mentioned Vin Vendors because I then one of my questions, which I'm about to ask, does actually um, touch on Vin Vendors. Yeah. Um, okay, my, you have to forgive me, uh, everyone out there, because some of my questions are a little bit of a paragraph. Okay, thinking along the lines of movies, I believe that you made a research proposal for the RCA, Royal College Bar, that looks at the film director, Finn Vendors. Why this film director, and does his films, or photography, because I know he's uh, done some photography, he had a yeah. recently a show at the um, Blaine Southern, a series of his photos, I think, taken on Polaroids. Yeah. Okay, so, um, or photographs. Let me re-ask the question. Why this film director and does his films, photography, inform your paintings? And does the subject of his films inform your own painted content? Um, so, Vin Vendor's uh, sort of road movie trilogy from, from the 1970s, so the three films he made kind of back to back, um, Alice in the Cities, Wrong Move and Kings of the Road, they were like a, a starting point uh, for the proposal that I made for, for my M film at the Royal College of Art. As subsequently has happened, I've moved a long way from that starting point. Um, but I, I did go on a number of trips to find locations from his films that I was looking at. And oddly, the whole process began by appropriating an image from Alice in the Cities to make a painting from some time ago um, and at the time what it did was it just it seemed to fit in with the the kind of the, the range of paintings that I was making at the mm. time um, you know, probably nine tenths well probably more than nine tenths were based on my own photographs but there were a few which had uh, which were taken from films and they, they had the, the right kind of atmosphere that felt like it fitted with the, the series. So I made this one painting which was based on a still from, from the Vin Vendors film mm. and then at the time thought nothing more of it. Um, a couple of years later I, I ended up going to the location where that particular scene was shot and taking photographs and so on. And then in a roundabout way that actually led me to, to decide to go back into education mm. um, and as I say subsequently the actual research I've been doing has gone off on a completely different path. Okay well yeah at this point because I was going to ask regarding your PhD actually so so Finn Vendors was very important so very important regarding your paintings does he inform you I know you probably just said this but I'm going to mm. re, re, um, ask again do obviously there's the PhD aspect which I still haven't finished uh, talking about but how do he how does he inform your that painting process paintings in itself so is this something I mean um, I don't I mean I, I other than other than the uh, the compositions that I've appropriated from from his work I think it would be hard to say exactly what might be the influence? Um, I've been I've been you know interested in film for a long time, and some of the paintings that I've been making, I like to think that some of them have a kind of feel of what might be a moment from a film. Often the moment before something's happened, or okay. the moment after something's yeah, happened. I that. Um, mm. And I think that's as you know as direct a thing that I could say necessarily. Uh, so it's more about content and how to picture your content than the way to make it. Yeah, I guess it's it might be a bit nebulous, but it's as much as, you know, how something feels. So, so it's like an the event. feel of an image. So it's like an event, a moment, an event. Yeah, I suppose a moment could be the right way to describe it. Okay. Yeah, for some reason I keep thinking of the philosopher, French philosopher Alain Badger. Who talks about the idea of the event, like the rupturing 
time and space, time, a moment, a rupture, a, a, yeah. a revolutionary moment. Yeah, a rupture. But, but I, I would say sort of most of the paintings I've been making recently you know, mm. are either side of that, so they're, they're, they're not what you might call an event, they're, mm. they're something where an event might be about to happen, might have happened, but not. Like a stilled moment. Yes. Yeah. A certain amount of silence to it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's obviously because we still haven't finished with uh, Green Fingers here. Um, keeping okay, keeping in mind your research proposal, sorry, program. Has mm. there been any significant development within your existing art practice? Are you making paintings? Uh, are you still making paintings? And is Vin Vendor still relevant to your research program? Like, is he still relevant to? Well, I think there might be something which comes back in, but more broadly, uh, that that isn't the case. And the the sort of work I've been making recently, um, most of it hasn't been, or the work I've been making as part of the, the research, uh, you know, hasn't been painting. So it's been more photographic. Photo photographically based or you know even film video and so on so you know that's the way the practice has gone in relation to, to the research that I've been doing okay um, okay and how is your PhD going is it going well are you okay with that um, I think there's something that you know when you're in the middle of a PhD you, you don't realize you, yeah <laughs> And then where, uh, how many years have you been doing it for now? Um, I've been doing it for two and a bit. Okay, so how long is it meant to go on for, this duration? Is it? Well, if, if it goes to PhD level, then that will be six years part-time in total. Wow, that's nice. That's a, that's a lot of time. It's almost it's double the, an undergrad time. Well, it's because I'm doing it part-time. Oh, okay. And do they give you a studio space? The, um, um, well, part part timers don't have they don't. studio space. What about the full timers? Do they get studio yeah. space? Okay. But do you get allowed to go into all the different lectures and? Oh yeah, of course. You you, you know you've got access to yeah. all of the, the you know the program. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Gosh, it's funny actually. The two next questions are the beefy ones, and then there's one under that's slightly smaller, and then the rest get. That's straightforward. Okay, now, regarding your paintings mm -hmm. content, some of your paintings for me invoke the notions of non place by Marc Auger. Online, sorry, online information says, forgive me, sorry, I'll re repeat this. Online information says non place refers to an anthropological space, spaces of transience where the human beings remain anonymous and that do not hold enough significance to be regarded as places. For example, of non-places would be motorways, hotel rooms, airports and shopping malls. Would you say that some of your painted subjects relate to the notion of non-place? Uh, so I feel like the idea of non-place is really overdone. It's so, I don't know whether it's a fashionable idea or whatever. Um, and although I have made paintings which, you know, I've, I've made a painting of an airport, made a painting of a motorway, generally I don't inhabit those spaces. Um, and actually I feel like a, a lot of my paintings, you know, look at particular locations. Um, and I think that the, the non-place, as I understand it, uh, it's sort of like a, an ahistorical um, space. So it's a space which doesn't have a history, it's sort mm. of an, an immediate space, mm. and it's a space which could kind of be anywhere. Uh, and t t to be honest, I, those aren't the sort of places that I often spend time in. You know, where I work, I work in a building which is well over 100 years old, I live in a building which is over 100 years old, and because of their age, the, and their location in history, they're also very much a place. You know, so like stylistically in terms of the architecture, it's not an interchangeable building that we're sitting in now, the building that I work in, it's, it's 
you know, it, it's very much located in time and place. Um, I mean, maybe there's something of the anonymity, uh, but I think, you know, some of the, some of the um, paintings of recent years, some of the small paintings, you know, they were chosen because of the specifics of their place. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I don't think I have the particular ones here, but, you know, there's a painting I made, which is um, some houses with a bit of rough ground in front of it. And although it's not immediately obvious, there's nothing in the painting to tell you, it's the site of the Berlin Wall. And that's very much a place of, you know, a site with history, with a you know, defining sort of location attached to it. So you would, it would be safe to say that, um, that I would think that looking in, or ask, I'm now asking you this question, mm. the idea of non-place in that sense of uh, anthropology or non -anthrop you know, non sort of with a non-identity, if you like, such as a, a motorway cafe, is just yeah. not something that you would really be thinking about. You just you're interested well, more think, in something. I think the idea of transience is perhaps interesting because mm. a lot of the work that I've done in recent years has been based on sort of travelling around um, but they feel very locatable or to me anyway uh, and I have done a fair bit of travelling which involves travelling by train and mm. you know you're on a train going from one city to another city and even if they're, they're in different countries or whatever it's a very different experience from, from flying because you, know, you get to see the landscape changing as you move through it. Um, so you, you, you might have the sort of anonymous feeling and you might not be yourself uh, attached to the place in any way, but you're, you're, you know, it's still very specific and definable. Um, you know, if you go to lots of major railway stations in, in cities around Europe, which is where I've done most of my traveling, they're very stylistically locatable. You know, they're, they're not interchangeable spaces whereas perhaps airport, air, airports being much more recent might be more interchangeable um, but you know the difference between I don't know a major railway station in London and a major railway station in Germany or somewhere in Scandinavia and of course different countries in Scandinavia are again quite locatable you know they're, they're quite distinctive they're not they're not for me anyway they don't, they don't really feel like they're non-places as such um well I, I, marc Andre speaks about um there's a church in paris um i forget no is it paris no um a village it's somewhere in france and he refers to all the history the collective history that's grown around that church building so mm. i forget it's in the book remembrance of things past oh um i forget the name the author now um, Marcel Proust. That's correct. Yeah. And in the first chapters, it refers to the idea of the church having this identity, collective history, and that uh, Marc is saying that that has, you know, history in terms of anthropology that has collective memory, yeah. etc. Where it's grown, it's organic. Whereas with non-space and non-place, these are these slips through, time, you know, through. Spaces that don't have no identity, and you, you kind of you, you sense that you understand that that mm. has no real collective memory, they're just places that we move through. Empty airports are just sort of in fact, there was that film that came out quite a long time ago, well, back in the noughties with um, Tom Hanks was in, I don't know if you think that, where he was having to almost he weren't allowed out of the airport because of his uh, because of his nationality and there was an issue with their country or something. They get, is it called Terminal, I think? Maybe. But he had to almost like create his own personal, almost personal history, living mm. in this, you know, the airport for, I think, for a couple of years, almost like forming his own identity within a non-space, almost like negating the idea of non-space with his own personal dialogue. But yeah, I, it's interesting because I like some of your works make me think of that. But actually, there are other paintings that don't. That does deal with almost something anthropological, something that when I, something that has history. Like this painting here, you're referring to the history yeah. of yes. You know, the, the, I mean, certainly with with that painting there, um, stylistically, the houses mm -hmm. are quite sort of locatable. Um, mm -hmm. In, in the sense that, uh, you know, if you sort of, you know, 
enough experience recognizing architecture. You could tell that you know, they look like they're in Europe, but they don't look like they're in southern Europe. Um, yeah, it could be anywhere, couldn't it? Could be in Kent somewhere, in Mason. Well, I, I, I think there are some clues about in the buildings which okay. would suggest it's not in, <laughs> in the UK. Okay. Um, I think there are enough stylistic clues yes. to suggest that it's somewhere in northern Europe. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe you know, I'm reading too much into it. It's hard to, to see the image, you know, completely fresh, and it's hard to see the image as if you know you hadn't seen it before when when the other person has made it. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the, you know, setting aside the fact that it's it's based on a recreation of a shot from a film, mm. you know, the content within the image being held sort of relies on on I, I suppose a certain historical well a certain historical awareness perhaps of, of you know uh, that particular time and place interesting because the other painting over there of coastal line yeah of a, uh, almost like Dover or somewhere well maybe not Dover but the edge of the land yes is obviously um, I wouldn't think of non-space when it comes to a space like that to me that yeah is not a non-place in its sense but it's still a space that we don't necessarily occupy, but it still has, a, it's still a space that has a history, physiotomy, organically, yeah. you know, you know, waves come in, you know, things have changed, the erosion of the, of that land, yeah. landslide, whatever, into the water, very different, but it's still, it's, it's not a non space, is it? It's a, yes, it's a, very much a, you know, a place which could, why that painting though? Why, what made you decide that one? I mean, yeah, it's a lovely painting. What, what, why, what? Uh, that, that was really, I suppose, just a, almost a, a sort of stylistic exercise. Of it. Obviously, it's, it is based on a photograph, but it's nearly abstract in the sense that you've got, you know, three sort of horizontal bands of different tones, um, you know, a light grey, a mid grey and a dark grey, and then the dark grey band is broken up with sort of nearer horizontal bands so really although it's a painting of some particular cliffs um, it could practically function as, as something abstract really in terms of the yeah. formal qualities Let's show the camera It's the first time I've seen that work is today And you showed this, didn't you, at the solo show at the Crypt in Marleybone, I remember. Yes. So, yeah, this was in one of the paintings that I had in the um, show there, which was, oddly, it was called Provisional Cities. I gave the, you know, the show a name. Um, this is probably one of the only paintings which didn't actually have a particular city kind of attached to it. Mm. It's, it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's a stretch of coastline. Almost all the other work was, you know, more urban in character. Mm. It's a lovely painting. Uh, have you done any other paintings like this? Um, not so much. In, in a way, it's just something of a, a one-off, really. Uh, yeah, so it was something which, not I think, yeah, too, too much really just calling it experiment, but it was just, I was just interested in the formal aspect of the of the you know the composition and the photograph that it came from do you think you'll be doing any more uh hard to say really um yeah i, I, I don't know I don't, I, it's very difficult to say what sort of things i'll do in the future yeah of course uh, do you, would you say that there's a fundamental um, okay things obviously changing in uh, certain ways because of being on the landfill you're seeing yeah. things in new ways but do you think um there's a theme within your paintings has there ever been a theme like some artists have a theme you know you know you see it in each work there's a close yeah. close connection or do you see yourself not in that way but the theme is the black and white uh well i think through time there have been you know you end up with different sorts of maybe not sets of work, some some clearly quite distinguished. 
a lot of the work I've been making recently, the smaller paintings, um, are, are based on photographs that I take on travels mostly around, you know, around the UK, around Europe, and some of those have a very, very broad and loosely defined theme of being some kind of comparative topography, so what different kinds of spaces that have similar functions look in different places. So the, the difference between the London Underground and the U-Barn, for example, um, and, and other kinds of places like that. Uh, I think it's, too, yeah, I don't know whether I would say I, I work in any, with any particular theme in mind. You know, there was a point a few years ago when I was making larger paintings, which are sort of more like uh, sort of tableau type paintings where they, you know, kind of, I suppose, referenced a sort of 19th century um, salon style paintings, although again, these were, were still in black and white. So they, they were kind of looking at the sort of mode of address that you'll get from that kind of painting, whereas it's still referring to sort of photographic imagery. Do you think you'll ever do larger scale paintings again, or do you think you're going to remain with the smaller works for the moment? Um, well, for the time being, it, it's largely just a practical thing for in terms of, sort of space and time. So uh, rather than investing a, a lot of time working on sort of one large painting for several weeks, it's just, uh, I think, you know, in some respects, it's a, it's a bit more flexible to be working small, so you can work on a few different things, um, and they, they, you know, they don't sort of you know, block out your studio time for weeks, really, as much as anything else. Have you ever pondered on, actually, um, so instead of just working from photographic data, have you mm. ever considered working on site and maybe travelling and doing work on site? Have, have you ever considered that? Well, I, I mean, I used to work from direct ob, direct observation, mm. sort of, you know, pretty much up to the point I went to art school. Mm. Um, and I don't know whether it's the actual experience of going to art school or just getting excited by photography when I went to art school. So, you know, photography then started to function as a sketchbook. Um, and some of the, the big paintings that I've done, it just seems so impractical <laughs> to go and do yeah. those outside in the environment, um, spending several weeks going back to the same location with all the, you know, all the equipment that you need to go and make a work like that. Uh, yeah, I, I, and of course, you know, working from photographic imagery, there's something else which happens as well as, as you know, the direct observational approach. Um, so I, I mean I can't I can't see myself you know making paintings sort of out in the environment, um, but then again the you know, logistics might be yeah the the logistics of mm. the practicalities of doing mm. work like that um, sort of mitigate against it to a certain degree. Mm. Okay, well speaking about a big painting, my, the other question actually. Um, um, which slightly moves away from the other question, which was dealing with the ideas of non-place. But in a painting you made in 2009 titled uh, Protest, which is a very big painting, shows a crowd gathered near Bank of England. And we see um, a few interesting uh, protesters, not in conversation with their fellow comrades, but instead engrossed in personal interests, uh, like the lad with the huge board, funny enough, on site drawing, with paper, and it appears that he is either painting or drawing. And then there's another guy who's playing a violin. Are these characters staged, uh, put there by yourself, or were they simply part of the moment? Um, where uh, you had no real relationship with them. Have you ever made a staged photo shoot for the purpose of uh, gathering visual data for a painting? And funny enough, let me drop this one in, I wasn't going mm -hmm. to, but we just spoke about the idea of moments. 
yeah. not being an event for you. But actually, that as a protest is like a, an event, a moment. In, yes. So maybe we can touch on that. But yeah. Yeah, I mean that. So that that painting is coming up to ten years old. Um, and it, it so it wasn't staged, it was based on, well, it was actually based on, I think, three photographs that I took as part of the protest. So all the people in the, the photograph are doing what they were doing at the, at the moment that I took the photograph, which forms the central section of it. And then, you know, I, I expanded it by sort of adding um, aspects from another couple of photographs. So there's a bit of a collage it. going on. Yeah, so it's a bit of a... And there were other works that I made around that time, uh, a bit earlier from that, um, such as the, the piece called Sinking Contemporary Novel and the painting called Projection and there were a few others which, which were set up. So, you know, I had the idea for what the pitch was about and then, you know, had somebody to model for it. Um, and so you did have someone yeah. to model. Ah. So, I, I, you know, I made a few paintings that okay uh, as I say you know sort of I think we touched on it earlier talking about the kind of idea of the, the mode of address to, to an audience yeah. um, but you know I, I haven't made anything like that recently although I suppose you know you, you could say that this this painting does have that staged aspect to it um, so it was staged when I took the photograph uh, but when I did that, it wasn't done actually to make a painting from it. Um, so, you know, the, the painting bit came afterwards, after the, you know, I, I, I had the photographs and I, I realised that it might make an interesting painting. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that it's interesting that the, because you're looking at it and you think, wow, you know, there's this event going on, there's this protest, but instead you've got these characters. I mean, the violin makes sense. Someone standing there, you know, yeah. the masses want some jolly, uplifting sounds. You might not have someone on the decks, but you've got someone on the violin. Um, but the interesting part is when you're seeing the lad doing a drawing of something or painting something, yeah. observing. And, uh, you know, the artist observing. You're observing the artist observing. And I always, I do find that really fascinating. Yeah. Well, it's interesting with, with that... Um painting from the, the source photographs there's lots of people in in the in the picture who, who've got cameras and who are taking photos filming or whatever and then there's one figure in the middle who's who's doing a drawing in the middle of this sort of large protest um, but yeah it was just that very much is a moment and an event I guess but an event that's going on around outside of you yeah. You, you're, you know, you're there. Were you there protesting for the day? Or? Oh, I, I was definitely there protesting. So when I went on that protest, I didn't think that I was going to make a painting from it. That wasn't my, my intention. Was that when the um, the new government, that the Tories got back in with their coverage? No, that, the... that was before that. That was, uh, oh, was it? under the last Labour government. Oh, actually, new Labour. Right, yeah, so that was after the financial crash and there was oh, a protest okay. against the way the... Oh, right. Okay, so that's before the TUC did the huge... Because uh, they think they did 2010 or 11. Yeah, so, so this, yeah, the actual protest was in 2009, which was before... And that the, was the way we bailed out the banks. Yeah. Mm, interesting, yeah. Just on the point when the Tories were getting back in. Well, I mean, it was you know, a year and a bit before, mm. before the Conservative government... Well, the Conservative-led coalition happened. Yeah. Interesting, because yeah, I went on a demonstration. I think it was had to, it was right, it was organised by TUC, and I was it was a really interesting day. I mean, I wasn't affiliated with anyone. I wasn't there with a particular organisation. I just sort of wanted to go along and express a certain amount of visible um, to myself that I was there part of something. And that was that was two thousand and ten or eleven. But uh, yeah, funny enough, um, with the politics, we don't. I um, wanted to ask a question, which is a little more generic, but also. Mm -hmm. Be interesting to have hear your take on things, especially in relation to that painting. Yeah, you know, taking into consideration your reasons for that painting of that called protest and those things going on within the in the motif. 
But the other question I have in mind is this. Um, in today's economic and political climate, with hard Brexit versus soft Brexit, austerity, and taking off public assets, privatisation, healthcare, etc. What is What would you say is the role of art? And what should the role of contemporary art practice, and in particular painting, look like? What should art painting be in these times for you as a contemporary painter? What should its potential role be? Now, at the end of that question, how maybe something from the previous qu uh, question can inform you on this question. But when I ask that question, I'm not, I don't have some kind of you know, preconceived yeah. idea what it should be. I'm just generally asking most people what we are in very interesting times. How do you think there's a role for art to play in this or not? What do you think is best? I mean, I don't know if I would say that there's anything that necessarily art should do other than perhaps to, to reflect, you know, what's happening contemporary in the contemporary world. Um, I don't know if there's anything in particular that it can do as such. Uh, it, you know, it, it can be part of a, a general atmosphere, perhaps. Um, and I think when I made the, the protest painting, mm. uh, I guess I was quite concerned up to a point in, in sort of reflecting my everyday life. Mm. Uh, you know, perhaps I wouldn't have made that painting if I hadn't gone on that protest. So, mm. I, you know, I wouldn't have chosen it as a subject. Um, I mean, I, d I don't know if there's any sort of uh, great impact that that art can have it. I, think, I guess it depends on what you're defining as art. Uh, I mean, you know, maybe a film lo maker like Ken Loach yeah. could have more of an impact. That's something on, something about on about television that. probably has could have some some impact. Uh, these days, there's lots of things you know in the digital world which might end up having an impact. Um, if you know, if we're talking about you know, I guess in, in whatever way you want to, to describe it, some things which can you know change can affect change. Um, I like you mentioned Ken Loach. I think that's a really good, um, yeah, really good person to identify there with his recent film. Well, there's the I Daniel Blake. He's just also released a new film recently, which is about um, what was it? Let me just get my mind there. Is it, oh god, what's the new film he's just did? I think it's called Sorry We Missed You. Yeah. But he, I would say, yes, he's, he, he that as a film, it, it's sort of questioning the idea of government policy and how austerity has affected um, northern working class, you know, working classes in different areas of mm. communities up and down the country. And yeah, in a way, sort of film has it's quite contemporary it's immediate more people seem to go to cinemas and theatres and well there's a lot there's a huge interest in cinema and theatre production mm. so I always think about artwork as being a trigger for conversation as opposed to yeah do you think maybe do you think painting is quite antiquated and may not be able to have the same effect as Cinema, maybe you think. Well, it's it, it's not a mass medium, so it doesn't have that you know uh, mass audience. So, do you think um, artists maybe should just paint? Well, it it depends depends what they. I mean, it, it, you know, painting is is you know one part of a big continuum. Um, and it's obviously clearly defined by its medium, which includes the idea of the precedence of it. Uh, I mean, I don't know if there's any any should about it. People like making making paintings. Do you think the one you did protest, which yeah. obviously was conveying a political moment, a rupture in in a moment, and mm. uh, the protest against uh, bankers' bailout? Do you think there's something more interesting about that because it's less 
say, propagandist, but more playful, more... Well, I, I think it is, well, I hope it is kind of playful. Mm. I mean, ultimately, um, you know, the, that, that protest and others didn't change anything. So, uh, you know, perhaps it's, it's just, a, you know, an exercise of an expression of, of wanting to make oneself... Uh, stand out from the status quo. Mm. Um, I mean, talking about that that specifically. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I I I do find it quite very you know very playful with the 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 way you sort of splice the image and you sort of you put these little characters in and you paint them in and it's sort of interesting to see this. You've got this thing going on, but you've got this artist going and drawing and it just it just. It's a bit more. It's not so black, um, so black and white, now, but not so dry and so. This is what it is. Well, you know, the, at the process itself, there's a certain kind of carnival atmosphere. So, mm. I mean, hopefully, some of that actually comes through in the painting. Okay, well, that's interesting. Now we are moving into some more slimmer, more quicker questions. Moving away from the uh, political side of things, what is the best way to exhibit art and painting in your case? Now it's funny you just mentioned uh, box frames earlier on about how you put your paintings yeah. in box frames. So, the significance of the box frame for you um, and exhibiting is the best way. I mean, I don't know if the box frame does have any significance other than protecting the fact that it's quite a small painting and it's quite easily uh, damaged or whatever. Um, I mean, some, some of the other uh, works I've made, you know, I've been working a lot with painting on paper recently, so, so this painting itself, although I had some ideas about how I wanted to show it, um, when I, when I did exhibit it last, it was hung on the wall with bulldog clips. So it was almost, I wanted the painting as the object to kind of disappear. And I did want to try showing it by pasting it directly onto a wall. So it's not even sort of separated from it. Um, I guess the next logical step would be just to paint directly onto the wall. Um, yeah, interesting. Because that changes what the, that changes what the meaning of the object is. Um, now that's interesting. So obviously you're moving away from just this idea of an illusion, illusionistic image because even the fact you mentioned an object makes me think of a minimal object, minimalism or something. Well, no, I think what I'm talking about, you know, the typical painting which is on the canvas, you know, when you think of the word painting, it makes you think of something which is constructed from wood and cloth and then, you know, pigments and materials which bind the pigments so on so that that's a clear clear kind of discrete object you know something pasted on paper onto a wall i mean obviously it's still this physical stuff but i think what my intention were with that piece was to have it to start to disappear as an object. and that's this one yeah so this this painting here um for for, for most uh exhibitions you wouldn't just be showing it like this you know not in a frame, um, it's not supported it's by anything. It, yeah, it's completely vulnerable. Um, you know, I could at this moment just tear it in half. Don't. Um, but what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is one of the things that I was kind of interested with this painting is trying to make the paintedness of it, you know, the painted object to kind of uh, disappear as much as anything as much as is possible to do that yeah because interesting some of your other, some of your paintings have an object feel to them like the one you just put down there because it's being on board it's quite yeah it's quite large there's that you can lift it it's it's tableau yeah, it's, it's, it stands out from the wall yeah of course yeah. now um so this there is something about the structure of the work that's important to you as yeah. an object um and 
thinking of that, I mean, I do think of the way um, the uh, with the minimalist, the the the, the just the, the whole exhibition space and the viewer became part of the work. The idea of the whole space, the work, the people become that part of the work and the experience yeah. of viewing that work and um, sort of phenomenologically speaking that now you're referring to your work as an object as opposed to just as an illusion or a picture like mm. in a picture and you know when you look at a picture it's this you know you think you're looking at you know three-dimensional space the illusion but you're talking more about an object something that's almost sculptural well, I, I wouldn't say it's sculptural, but it, it is an object and it exists in a space. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're talking about this through the medium of a, of a, of a video. Uh, but, um, it, you know, these paintings are physical things which exist in a space. They're, they're not, you know, digital information which can display, be displayed anywhere. I think that's what I what I'm getting at with with you know the idea of the painting like as an object. One of the reasons for making them is you know they are just discrete, unique objects. It's not like a text. So a text can exist in a book, but in any book, if the text is the same letters, it's still the same text. Whereas an image, if it's a digital image, it could be displayed on many screens and it's the same image. Whereas a painting. It's locatable in time and place, and you know to see the real painting. Although most of the paintings that we encounter these days, you know, we encounter through books and increasingly through websites and so on. Um, you know, the actual painting as an, an object is something which exists somewhere uniquely. Um, mm. And I suppose that's, that's so. Some of the reasons that I might want to try to find slightly different ways of showing things is. I think, guess it almost a frustration with some of those mm, interesting we could come back to that the idea of frustration with that actually you've got a work behind you which hasn't been seen but i can also be talked about as an object this work here the flat i keep thinking of the um the essay flatbed picture plane um and here you have something which is really it's quite different to the other things you you've made well, what we've shown today and what we've seen. Uh, well, I mean, one of the reasons is it's a very old painting. Um, it's, uh, but it has the object feel to it, obviously, yeah, because of the way yeah. you're uh, so, it. So, um, years ago, I used to make trompe l'oeil paintings, and, you know, this is one of them. Uh, the reason it's here is as much as anything, because I have been in the process of reworking it, um, so it's unfinished in its current state, uh, and it, you know it's it's sort of like a work in progress, but also it's it's a much older work, um, and you know one of the reasons for it having I suppose some of those qualities we're talking about, it, you know, it's painting on board, and the reason for it being on board is because of the, the amount of detail. Uh, you know, I wanted to get a, a really flat, smooth surface where there's nothing to, to sort of interrupt that detail mm. of, of the painting of it. But I mean looking at this I, I am it doesn't surprise me that you're what you are discussing your work in relation to the idea of an object. I don't often hear realist painters mm. and I say realist painters, you know, within that sense of representation of Real, you know, work, real world of science painted, depicted. Yeah. But it don't. I don't often hear, you know, many painters talk about their paintings like that realist as objects as such. And maybe one, and I don't hear them talk about it. But I know by looking at their work, it comes across as an object. And that being James White. And I look at them and I think of an object because yeah. of the way they're set within a perspex box. You look at them that like, as an object. Yeah. But you have something going on in a similar way, but in a slightly different way to obviously himself, the way you construct yours or not the way he constructs his. Mm. But there's an object feel to, to your work that as an object. And, you know, if we were having a tutorial, I'd probably be saying to you, oh, you know, you should be looking at, uh, you know, Alan Charlton or something like that. 
very flat monochrome paintings, but they feel like objects. Mm -hmm. You can go up and, you know, you feel like you're allowed to take it off, like hold it and go, ah. As opposed to some artists, you go, you, 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 oh, you shouldn't be touching it. You, know, you should leave it as a, it's a picture. Yeah. But you have that kind of object that you want to lift it and look, which well, I find really interesting. I think, what, you know, one of the, the functions with Fontroy painting is um, if it functions well, it's not so much that it deceives your eye, but that it adds an element of uncertainty as to what's painted and what isn't. So in the past, and maybe this isn't the best example of it, um, lots of people have commented on the masking tape that I've painted into the paintings and every once in a while somebody will want to try to peel at it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so weirdly you have that kind of, I guess that un uh, uncertain principle or, or, or more that you have the moment like where the viewer looks at it and you you think that it's painting but there's a, a nagging doubt somewhere you think is that actually a, a piece of masking tape. Um, and so that you know that brings the painting through its own, own illusionism you know it starts in, entering into the world of objects you know that, that we exist in I guess I don't know if that really answers the question but uh, I mean you know you, you mentioned the 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 sort of like the flat bed mm. picture plane yeah and that's one of the funny things about trompe l'oeil painting a lot of trompe l'oeil painting anyway is is trying to be a pretty flat surface in order for the illusion to work and so yeah. it kind of it has that modernist quality while at the same time being really illusionistic which is sort of antithetical to modernism so it exists in those two camps at the same time mm. but you also mentioned frustration about you just used the word frustration yeah which i found oh, that, that, that appears to me the point on the you mentioned yeah frustration the frustration of exhibiting work so you don't feel like you want to be you know that sense of just you make a picture you stick it in a wall done you, does that frustrate you oh no i don't think that i don't think that frustrates me what is um, that frustrates you then i think that the the, 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 the frustration with uh i suppose some of the things that you have to negotiate in making a painting perhaps as much as anything um, and one of the things that you know I've done with more more recent paintings in, in the fact that you know they're no longer so big, they're no longer so constructed, so they're kind of you know taking a photograph and then making like a painted version of it. They're getting much closer to a photographic outcome than than they used to be. Although you know superficially they might look the same, they might have the, some of the same photographic qualities. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like some of the, the, the I, th I guess, the, the frustration comes in trying to negotiate some of those things in terms of the actual making of stuff. Um, you know, going back to, to the idea of writing, the sort of non-objectness of writing, you know, writing and perhaps music, although music's different, those kind of artworks which exist in those sorts of spaces, um, they're, they're almost not, not weighed down by the physicality of them. And I don't know, something that in a way at the moment at least appeals to me, uh, I guess. When you say the non-physicality, do you mean the, 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 there's meaning? There's meaning expressed, conveyed as a as an artistic gesture, as a series of signs placed on a light object. That being the idea of a book, page, a page that is light doesn't have a lot. Of, well, what, what I mean is, you know, that that you know, the, the the text of a book exists wherever that text can be read. So it, you know, it can be in a physical book, it can be digital, you know, it can be multiplied, you know. Sort of, uh, as many times as possible and it's still the same thing it's still always that text however that text is able to be read it's still that text um, which to me seems like a really seductive thing it's possible to make something which isn't 
you know, I suppose it's like the strange coming from somebody who's been making lots of paintings to to uh, to to be you know to have something I don't know something that appealing about something which you know I mean maybe it's just to do with living in the times that we're we're living in and you know think, thinking about environmental concerns and you know consumption and so on but, okay. uh, I don't know something about as I say the, the lightness of, of a text which I, I like okay there, I'm going I, and actually in the next question which I'm not going to come to just this moment but the, there's a question in there that talks about new media actually yeah. because you just mentioned about new ways of doing things today new digital, digital media etc but actually going back to another question um, obviously we just touched on the idea of frustration Mm. Um, something else that went through my mind, my interest is when you're talking about working directly on a wall, um, making a work, and you mentioned about, hey, you know, why not just like direct on a wall? That obviously being a mural, it's a very old school yeah. way of approach, you know, it's got history, excuse me, it's got history that goes back, you know, pre Renaissance, mm. um, you know, obviously pre Renaissance, cave paintings. Um, but I like that idea. This idea of working on a wall directly. So when you when you were talking about that, were you referring to placing the the painted paper onto the wall, or literally putting pigment to wall? Well, when when I was talking about this particular work, I was talking about you know placing it onto a wall. What about painting pigment directly onto the wall as a traditional mural? Have you ever thought about that? Um, I mean, I've I've never painted my own murals, but I. I worked with another artist on a mural that he painted um, it's quite an enjoyable experience but I think more I was just talking about the idea of again going back to, to like the object of, of the painting kind of disappearing you know there's an artist who was doing that it's come to my mind, uh, mind. I think it was in the 70s Neil Bochner he did a series of uh, works on brown paper mm. um, like parcel paper yeah and over time they all disappeared uh, just got destroyed by yeah. but i think i was thinking more, more of somebody like richard wright you know who who paints directly onto the walls and then during the the exhibition the painting is there on the wall and, and at the end of the exhibition um you know it will be removed Fade. or oh. painted over you know okay. what pick what paint was he using then i mean I, I don't know it'd be interesting to know if you could put something on the wall so you've got two hours in the show, two, three hours, everyone's having a drink, a glass, you know, glass of wine. You've, you've done this prior, no one knows about it. Mm -hmm. And by the time the end of the exhibition completes, it's finished. The words have just pretty much disappeared and, and leave the, the viewers absolutely perplexed of what's happened. You know, have I had too many glasses of wine tonight because I can't see anything anymore? Wouldn't that be quite interesting, you know, just to see that disappear in front of your eyes? But what kind of paint would you have to use for that to happen? I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I'm being silly now. I just think it'd be quite amusing if I was in a gallery and all of a sudden the paintings well, disappeared. Well, that, that, that Banksy piece that went into a shredder, you know, while it was being auctioned. Um, mm. I mean, obviously, that's, that's a clear sort of comment on some aspects of... Commodification mm. of, of, of works of art. You have you looked at Mel Bockner's work, or um, I have to say I haven't, I haven't really looked at it in any any sort of detail. It could be interesting for you, I reckon. Mm. Just because I mean he's worked directly onto the wall as well. Well, paint on wall like this, like monochrome squares and that. And just I personally, voice he's he's one of those first ones who pioneered the ideas of conceptual art, but he's always said it, you know, dedicated. To the fact that he's a painter, he's always I am a painter. But measurements and sort of set, not to say set theory, but the idea of playful numbers are mm. used within his work and grids. Actually, yes, uh, grid. There's a, a work where he's got a plant pot in front of a wall that's got a painted grid on. So he's gridded up the wall, and then there's a plant pot put in front. So you've got this idea of an object, a painted wall with the grid. Um, I think you're. I find that quite intriguing. Um, actually, yeah, but the other question is, um, is there a future for painting and can new media inform painting processes? Well, the, the, I mean, the, the two, two questions. 
is there a future for painting? I guess there is a future for painting because painting has a past. Um, you know, painting is something that's existed historically, therefore it's not like you can uninvent it. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know what kind of future it has, uh, but you know, while it has that past, then, then it does have a future. Um, the new media, I, you know, I think you can quite clearly see there's quite a few painters who are influenced by mm -hmm. by new media. Um, you know, people like James Moore, um, Emily Sparks, for example. Uh, I guess Charlie Peters, perhaps. I don't know, you mm -hmm. know whether her work is directly influenced by it, but it does sort of feel like it is a bit. Um, so yeah, I think there there are clearly you know Dan Hayes actually Dan Hayes I think you know reflecting he's just on done a PhD isn't he? reflecting on 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 the role of screens in our mm. sort of everyday life like the, our life of perceptions of the world how the, the the screen has become you know the thing that we now interact with the world outside for a lot of the time mm. through through the screen and so that clearly is. His work as a painter. Um, yeah, because I mean, he was I, dealing with the pixelations, wasn't he? Was like, yeah, pixelations, the distortions imagery. of colour, mm -hmm. you know, all, all sorts of uh, aspects of, of visual imagery. So it's making reference to the way media has changed, the way we visualise the world, the way we yeah. frame the world. But there's also something playful at the same time, isn't there? It's, oh, definitely, like it's not I, just. I definitely think there's a playful aspect yeah. to it. How, yeah, I just missed a question. How do you, how, going back to like, how does your own work fit within contemporary art? That's a bit of a um, question. I think that's, that's up to other people. It's not, <laughs> it's not a question for me okay. as a person making it. Okay, fair enough. I think that's quite a nice answer. So leaving it for the viewers to make up their minds. Yeah, words. yeah. Okay, okay. Sweet, short and sweet. I like that. Cool. Um, okay. Um, should the Turner Prize engage in painting more, or do you think the John Moores has the has this covered efficiently? Well, I, and you're often in the John Moores. I mean, <laughs> I, I have been in it five five times, which we have but, here. Yeah. I think, you know, in terms of the Turner Prize, um, the Turner Prize has its own remit, um, and I think it it you know it pretty much does its remit. I don't think it. I don't feel like it neglects painting if you think about what its remit is. So I don't know if it, it should engage with painting more than it does. Do you think, I mean, sometimes when you look at the Turner Prize, it, it, you know, you look at those, that, um, the four artists that they're talking about mm. at, the, at the end of the year, around December time, which we're coming up for now. And I find it, high, it is highly um, conceptual. There's a lot of idea, you know, maybe there's a lot of work through aesthetics that's touching on ideologies. Um, was it, you, know, you know, there are certain issues about our culture, the way we're trying to process culture, the changes in our culture, you know, queer theory. Um, I mean, hey, you know, we've got this whole Brexit coming up. There's, it's all cultural things that are very much through language of art, the constructs of art, discussed. Whereas John Moores, when I, when I look at the John Moores, it is almost pushes more towards formalism um I, I don't know if i agree i mean the, the john moore's is a very different exhibition because it's you know what 50 60 painters all showing one work each whereas the Turner prize is a lot more detailed in terms of you have four paint uh, you have four artists and you know they put on their own exhibition within that so I mean, the, the John Moores and the Turner Prize are both doing very different things. Uh, so I, don't, I mean, I, I don't, don't feel like they're things that you can really compare to each other. So maybe the, uh, the, there's an individual artist that's more conceptual, whereas then there could be another painter who's more formalist, you know, more about the um, more abstract, more... Well, I think, I think that the, the John Moores Painting Prize works as a snapshot. I mean, it's obviously it's a snapshot of the entries that they get and it's a snapshot of what the judges 
tuition. Um, but most years it seems to be a pretty broad range of, sort of styles and approaches. It's a collection of different yeah. style. Because, mm. I mean, with the John Moores, only, you only have one painting exhibited. So it doesn't... And in a way, you think, I hope this can say a lot about my main practice. Whereas well, with the Turner Prize, yeah. I was gonna say, they're putting their whole... Yeah. Out there. I, everything. I mean, I I, 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 I... I wouldn't think that having one work in the, Turner, in, in the John Moores does say anything broad about your practice. It's just that one work. Um, and you've been in a few times, is it? Yeah, How's so, it been for you? Um, well, it's a, it's a nice exhibition to be selected for. Uh, it's always, oh, I've always had a good experience of, of being part of the exhibition, and uh, I guess it's a good it's a good showcase, and it's a good. I think it you know it looks good on the. TV as well. It's, ooh, it's always nice to see the whole mixture of contemporary painters all showing alongside each other. It's, and you're a member of Contemporary British Painting, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. And have you showed your work alongside other members of CBP in the um, the um, well? Uh, I mean, some of, some of the other members of contemporary British painting have been in the John Moores, you know, a few times. Uh, so, obviously, you know, that's purely down to the, you know, I guess the kinds of paintings that people are, uh, are making and, you know, who, who, who enters, who, who judges it each time. Absolutely. And we've got the um, applications coming out, I do believe, in February for the next John Moores. Yes. Which is like not that long now. No, no, it's uh, relatively soon. And do you think that the, like, would you say there's ever been a John Moores that you've been in that you felt that the prize winner wasn't something you would have, I mean, would have been enough artists in the industry, you think? They should have been the prize winners, apart from yourself. <laughs> well, I mean, it's hard to say, you know, what it is exactly that the judges are looking for and every year, or every two years, I should say, that you have a different range of judges. Um, I mean, you know, most times there are other artists who are showing in the exhibition whose work I perhaps would prefer to the work which is chosen, you know, to win the overall prize, but yeah. I think that's just natural, really. Yeah. Are you looking to apply for the next one? Um, yeah. Have you got any work in particular mind, or you got any existing painting, or are you going to make something? Um, I'm, I'm going to make, be making something for it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, last couple of years, last couple of John Moores I haven't directly made work specifically to enter, but, you know, I, I did make the painting of the protest, for example, was made specifically to enter it. Uh, so, yeah, I think, you know, th this one coming up will be like a specific piece to enter, which isn't to say that you can, you know, prejudge what it is they're looking for. I mean, I don't think there's any point in trying to do that. Actually, funny enough, I was going to ask the last question, actually, which was about thinking about John Moore's which we've just been talking about now mm. and your experiences and I was going to actually ask what would you say are the best memorable moments from being in the John Moores let's give it a nice little <laughs> question to that now yeah I think probably maybe the best moment for me for in, in, re in regards of the John Moores um, meeting Alexi Sale in, in 2013 yeah, yeah I mean, that, was, that was pretty good wow excellent and uh was he full of humour? Was he? Yeah, was... I mean, you know, he came across like he does, you know, in television on on, on the radio. Um, Did he come over here? Into here? No, no. When when they had the opening, you know, we had a relatively brief conversation. Mm. Uh, uh, it was when they were they were making a, a television program on the John Moore. Okay. 
Okay, well, I think we can wrap up here. Um, I've absolutely enjoyed listening to you talk about your work and that, and I hope that um, our viewers would have enjoyed listening. Uh, at this point, I would like to say to anyone out there who's been listening to this um, in conversation, if you are not yet subscribed to me, please do hit that button, subscribe, and even press the bell because that will notify you when um, other activities will be put on to YouTube that I would have done. Okay, thank you guys out there for listening. This is Nick Middleton. Um, this is it, it's, it's done. So next artist will be coming up soon. I've got a few I'm looking at and I'm in conversation with. So information will come very soon okay nice one thank you, thank you very much nick uh, nicholas thank you and uh cool yes